do 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 Extras. I don't know about anyone else, but I find it funny to see the mostly unemotional Rogers needling one of their own for the trace of sentimentality he showed in wanting to own the ancient Atarn plaque. Their showing up again did provoke a new discussion of how the Rakshashas were clearly tracking the party, and possibly aided by the very crystal they had given the party to communicate with. Little One was somewhat uneasy about this, again questioning their motives, but others, especially Draven, were more of the view that A, these guys are a freaky divination experts and can probably track whatever the hell they want anyway, and B, though it would be unwise to blindly trust the Rajas, they very clearly seem to have aligned themselves with the party, and all their exchanges so far seem to have turned out pretty well, mutually beneficial. So, until finding evidence to the contrary, it felt like it was worth taking their exact words as true, their probabilities as being about as accurate as you can expect bullshit probability numbers to be, and for the moment, hoping that their ultimate motives were not terrible, and therefore considering them allies, if perhaps shady ones. I feel like I brought it up before, but it's worth noting that the Centra crystal, the communication crystal, can be used by the party to contact the Rajas, but it has to be magically charged to call out. It has only one charge, but the mysterious Rakshashas can choose to recharge it remotely during the call, which means if you call them frivolously or bother them, they can just choose not to recharge it and you won't be able to contact them anymore. The safe deposit box with the Ginron controller fragment was set up by GE7 after the party had left for Vistria, but it was expected that they were coming back to the southern part of the continent after a while. If they had, finding the note from GE7 hinting at the existence of a northern facility and warning that they had to worry about the ancient priest himself being taken over, when they next met, that seemed like a cool plot hook to leave lying around. In practice, though, I toss out plot hooks left and right wherever they go, so teleporting to Vistria was like finding a new quest hub in an open world game. With so much going on, Orcs, Good Place, the Diluvian Treaty Offer, Beta, and then Zaheer's disappearance, there was never a strong reason to go to all the effort to teleport back to Bankton and the Chasm, so by the time they did, in this episode, the safe deposit box was mildly interesting, but was mostly like an old quest line they had out-leveled. In World of Warcraft, the quest would have gone gray in their loft. One thing I find funny is how I've set the bar for the art in TDDC so low in those early episodes that somebody actually commented how great it was to finally see Bankton, when I'm like, it barely manages to convey the idea of a large medieval city centered around a district of grandiose banks and public buildings. I actually googled and carefully picked out some city images from Paris to guide me, but you'd never know it from the copy and paste mess I made. Still. It is a sign of how I really am always trying to do my best and improve the look as much as I feel I can justify without taking forever to try and perfect things that are never going to look that great. I must have spent hours working on the shittyscape, or cityscape, just to get what you see there, and any more time would have been a total waste on such a minor part of the video. What you got gave the impression of the city's scale and the way the roads lead into the middle and that's all it needed to do. The worst thing in the whole episode, to me, is that I completely screwed up a possible plot connection regarding the Ilud Kuatoa who serve around Ginneron. In this episode, I named the new Ilud Envoy the military advisor to Don Horatio's Estado. I call him Envoy Lacoon. Somebody in the comments thought I meant the same KT Envoy mentioned way back in that cryptic note from Baob in episode 12. Of course, if you go back and watch that episode, it says Envoy Alundo. The problem is, the commenter was right. It is supposed to be the same name. It seems that over time, the character once named Olundo somehow got renamed to Lacoon in my notes. Like I just lost the name and made up a new one. Which is super annoying, because once an episode is published, I don't want to re-upload it and lose all those views and your comments. YouTube's really bad for that. 
you know there are 30,000 more views than it looks like on episode one? Because I fixed up and re-released the first episode a while back with the more exciting teaser intro to give a better first impression. I put the new one in the playlist and unlisted the old video, which had a rambling preamble and the old slightly dubious intro music. But it also had 30,000 views, which means the new episode one started over from scratch. But anyway, it's pretty shitty that this connection, which is supposed to be subtle, has to be pointed out, and it sure loses something there for those keen-eyed viewers who would have noticed it when re-watching the series. Not that it particularly comes up or seems important to the story, though the character is referenced in a similarly distant manner in the second campaign we started in the same setting while the main game is on hiatus, and I would love if the connection was there to be found and not all effed up like it is now. If you've been paying close attention, you may have noticed that the clothing-absorbing outfit Angel looted from Mordeval is supposed to only absorb and switch between cloth items, yet when she switches on the Aberration Handler's gear, an armor slot item, that has to suppress her plus four mythical chain shirt, which is, you know, not at all a cloth item. I tried to enforce this for a while, that she couldn't switch off the chain shirt without actually taking it off. It, even though it's light, it's armor, it still takes like a minute or half a minute with help or something. But in the end, we just rule of cooled it as an exception. A mithril shirt, straight out of Lord of the Rings, is as supple as clothing, so it wouldn't work with other metal armor, but the whole setup would not work well and would just be frustrating if she couldn't swap between her excellent, but boring, chain shirt and any cool leather armor Angel finds down the line. In the comments, I was asked, if Angel's outfit were to eat an aligned magic item, like the Red Cap's red cap, and whether the checkered vest would retain the Red Cap's starting bonus. Working backwards, the outfit Angel got from Mordeval absorbs all properties of a magic item, as far as we know, including any advantages, drawbacks, etc. So however many kills the hat had been charged with, those charges would carry over, and you would keep adding charges in the same way, by dipping the outfit in the blood of freshly killed sentient beings. And, like the hat, it's gross for a few seconds, but within a couple rounds the blood is completely absorbed and it no longer smells or anything. Note that once an item is absorbed, it's gone. So you aren't cloning charges, you can't extract the item from the outfit, so I think the potential for abuse is very limited. Especially since I have arbitrary control over when and whether any items are absorbed. That one aspect of the whole deal isn't really under the player's control. As far as absorbing aligned items, which the hat is technically not, it's clearly evil, but not to the point of having a clear or direct game effect. A good creature probably wouldn't want to wield it, as indeed our heroes rejected it, but there's no explicit stat penalty attached to doing so, so the hat would have been fine if they had saved it instead of Draven disenchanting it. An actual capital A aligned item, like an unholy scarf of, I don't know, increased spell DCs or something, which would bestow two temporary negative levels on a good character as long as they wield it. In theory, the disadvantage would apply only while you have the scarf active, equipped. Remember, Angel can activate, deactivate, or swap magic items that have been absorbed by the outfit, as long as she respects item slot limitations. Only one cloak at a time, one armor item, one set of gloves, etc. The powers of any items which are not active might as well be in suspended animation, within the checkered vest, so their advantages and disadvantages should not apply. So in theory, you could have an opposite aligned item in there, as long as you don't activate it, it should be no problem. In theory. So this was a bit of a short extras, but I need to get caught up, and I feel like there's more to talk about as more gets revealed from around this time in the campaign in subsequent episodes. My Patreon pr patrons who pledge even a dollar a month get extras videos a week early, so they have the chance to get their questions answered in the final version which goes up free on YouTube, like these. Arthur D. Gonzalez-Martin asked, 
It feels like most archaeologists in the setting are dwarves. Is that mostly because of the state of their abandoned homeland? Or does their culture put more value in that field of science than others do? It's true that because of their extraordinary interest in their own past and their ancestors, and their history, the three ancient dwarf holes that lie abandoned in a circle of mountains called the Iron Sea, because of that, dwarfin culture has a significant emphasis on archaeology, and it feeds into the natural wealth-accumulating and wealth-flaunting nature of the Dons, in that they love acquiring and competing for collections of historic artifacts, which are almost certainly not artifacts in the abnormally powerful magic item sense. But while other races don't necessarily venerate archaeologists quite the same way, there are plenty of humans who want to learn about the past. Few would call Zahir's people archaeologists, but before his village was found and destroyed by the orcs, they were renowned for using their phenomenal desert survival skills to find lost minor treasures from the Shadow War. And there was no shortage of Vistrian nobles willing to pay good money for a thousand-year-old sword or arrowhead preserved by the sands, and they'd even pay a huge premium for anything with heraldry that ties it back to their own family. With the loss of Zahir's people, there has been a renaissance of other archaeologists, including the mostly or all human groups, like the ill-fated ones who found the Ataran maintenance station. Laric has a stranger take, in that the halfling population had a humble, family-centered life prior to the disappearance of the powerful Adar. When they expanded out into that empty territory, finding few manufactured structures but many ancient psionic crystals which, scholars believe, helped to cause the high rate of psionic gifts among the modern Laric population. Because these artifacts, if that's even what they are, don't have the maker's initials or brush strokes or tool marks or ancient tomes that most archaeologists use to learn about the past, at least not that we can tell, this means most of Laric's researchers and discoverers of physical history are less physical. They're a branch of the psionic academy. That's who tries to divine lost information from these sparse remnants of the Adar civilization, and particularly, it's the academy who controlled the one real major set of structures left by those ancients, the intact island city of Viloya. It's the Academy that's constantly researching that city, still trying to tease out more secrets from it, and who limit access to the fantastical, gleaming metropolis left by the ancients. Of course, elves are much, much less interested in archaeology as a rule, because there are a number of them, not a huge number, but there are a number of them who have been there the whole time, as far as we know. They've already seen the past, you can just ask them about it. If you're an elf. Slumbery Storm asked, They have spent about two or three months out of contact with the world, then all of a sudden they come back to the world. Did the players go looking for information on what has been happening in those months? We sometimes mention or assume that Draven casts sending periodically for some information, because it doesn't cost anything but time if you aren't fighting that day like the many boring weeks in the tunnel. But the players didn't ask a lot of specific questions and weren't usually thinking about this, so after all that time, they did not find out much at all about what is going on in Vistria or in Tark. I believe they asked about the peace treaty and found out that it was accepted, but they don't know much else at this point. Once they were back in Laric and Tark, they got caught up on any goings-on in that part of the world, but those people don't have a lot of information about what's happening up in Vistria, past Deluvian-occupied Verandi and orc-infested Ura. Slumbery Storm also suggested that a TV channel should pick up Tales from My D&D campaign. That would be cool, right? But I think we all know, as far as TV, I think there are a lot of YouTube channels with a hundred times as many subscribers as me, and still television isn't interested in them. Maybe the networks should be interested, but they usually aren't. Going to take a long time and maybe a miracle or two to get that big. I want to give a big thanks to all my generous Patreon patrons. There's certainly room for more of your questions. Thanks so much for your continued support, with a special shout out to Sarosh, Surf USA, Gorfine, Zombie, Warsaw, Pericles, Lord Aben, Duskmar, and Tyranno MCG, the members of the organization. Plus, 
several other generous individuals who are donating at that level but don't seem to want the recognition. Though, if you're one of them and you change your mind, just send me an email with cloaked figure in a subject line, and we can figure out an avatar for you, like these guys.